Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens, episode 76 relationships. I am your host, Madison Whalen, and my co-host, Joseph Whalen. Hey, Maddie, how you doing today? Doing pretty good. As many of you can probably already tell, this is going to be very different to our normal episode since I am the one hosting this. That we have our uh, landscapers accompanying us because I thought they were done and they really weren't. So ah, great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, today we are going to be talking about relationships and the different kinds of relationships. Now, I'm pretty sure many people, when they hear the word relationships, they probably mean like a partner and partner kind of thing. But there's actually way more relationships. So we're going to go into the definition of relationships, the different types of relationships, and also the different types of toxic relationships and how to possibly get out of them. Okay. So... Shall we get into it? Let's get into it. Alrighty. So, when I looked up the definition for relationships, I didn't really see that there was any surefire way to describe it. There were many different definitions, so I have a few here um, that can hopefully describe a definition of it. So the first one I found was... Um, the way in which two or more concepts, objects, or people are connected or a state of being connected. Um, now, what are your thoughts on that, Daddy? Do you think that would be, um, a good way to describe any type of relationship? Well, I think that <clears throat> for the purpose of, of our discussion today, I think that's really it. It's, it's how two people connect or multiple people connect in this case here. Um, because as you said... The relationships that we're discussing here aren't romantic relationships necessarily. They are in some cases, but it's really how people get along. You get along with your peers, your family, uh, your partners, and so forth. So I think that's a, a pretty spot-on definition. Yeah. The second one is more of the romantic kind, saying a state of being connected by blood or marriage, which also goes into family as well. So... Um, any romantic relationship you had with a wife, husband, or whoever you got married with, um, and necessarily your children or your siblings or anyone like that. Absolutely. So, the third definition I found was the way in which two or more people or groups reg regard and behave toward each other, which I definitely think, like, that would go more for peers, like friends or strangers or anyone else you meet on a daily basis. Sure. I think you're talking kind of about the cliques you have at school where you have your own group of friends and you have other groups. Um, it may be coworkers. could be anything along those lines, I think. Mm -hmm. I also made up my own definition. Um, I would... I, I thought the definition for relationships would be any interaction in which two people react and treat each other. I think that pretty much sums all of these up, doesn't it? Yeah. Do you have any of your own definitions that you'd like to say? Uh, no, I, I think the, the ones that we have here certainly set the groundwork for what we're going to be discussing today. So I think what we can probably do is, is really lean more towards number four there, the one that, that you sort of summarized everything under. Yeah, like I noticed all the different um, factors that came into each of the definitions, and I decided, you know what, why not sum it all up? Yeah, I think that works. Alrighty, moving on to our next point in this 
part, which is the different types of relationships. And uh, this comes from our website called yourdictionary.com. Um, and they list different examples of relationships. So these can include a husband and a husband and his wife, or vice versa, or a husband and a husband, a wife and a wife. You take your pick. A brother and his sister, a sister and his brother, sibling relationships. Two businesses working together. Now, I don't think we actually discussed this entirely, but this is another one of those daily interactions that you could probably have with um, anyone. Sure, yeah. I mean, uh, in, in what I do for work, um, I do a lot of vendor relationship, vendor management. So <clears throat> we need to get services from the outside. And, you know, it's my job to reach out to different vendors, establish relationships, because again, you know, with anything, when it comes to relationships, trust is a big thing. Uh, so even in business, when you're dealing with suppliers or customers or whatever, you're always working towards building that trust. So it's just as valid a relationship to manage as anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And the final one was a father and his daughter, or the parent-child relationship. So, there was something that I actually found interesting on this website, and that was that they offered the different definitions of the types of relationships that you can have. And there were so many that I really probably couldn't mention them all, so I just put one down. So, the one definition I found was amity. Amity. Amity, something like that. So, amity. Amity. Which is the friendship or harmony between individuals or groups. And that's probably like, you said, the cliques at school. Sure, yeah. Sort of something like that. So, there are different ways to describe different, type, describe different types of relationships. Whether it be family, friends, or just someone you work with or you bump into um, when... Well, probably not now because... Yeah, there's not much bumping going on these days. Nope. <clears throat> so, uh, that's all I had for the different types of relationships. Our next segment talks about the different types of toxic relationships. I feel as though we need to mention that. I think you're absolutely right. So, let's take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll talk about toxic relationships. <laughs> For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So, I looked to a website called healthscopemag.com, which has a incredible article about toxic relationships and the different types of toxic partners. So, by definition, a toxic relationship is a relationship categorized by the behaviors by behaviors on the part of the toxic partner that are emotionally and, not infrequently, physically damaging to their partner. So, it basically means, like, someone can mentally or physically abuse someone in their relationship to the point where it's no longer healthy. Um, so, while, he while a healthy relationship contributes to our self-esteem and emotional energy, a toxic relationship damages self-esteem and drains energy. Now, you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I 
absolutely agree with the characterizations. We've talked in the past about uh, myself growing up as a kid. Um, my father was verbally abusive of my mother. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't physically abusive, but verbally abusive um, can significantly impact the quality of living that you have. Um, and the, I would even categorize the relationship that my mother and father had as a toxic relationship. My mother was very giving, very, very forgiving, um, and really went out of her way to take care of my father. And my father very infrequently appreciated that and, and was much more critical of my mother than she deserved. And as a result, it, it had, you know, a drain on her, her mental well-being over the course of 30 some years of marriage with him. So, uh, I definitely can attest to toxic relationships. Yeah. So a toxic relationship is normally categorized by insecurity, self-centeredness, dominance, and control. Now looking at more of, when I was looking more at the article, I noticed that most of the top, Toxic partners normally use control with mental um, things. Like, they'd, in, they'd make their partner insecure, they'd cause them to be um, anxious around them, and overall their mental health status would not be well with, around them. Yeah, a lot of that is the same techniques that bullies use. You know, bullies, because the, the bullies either... Fear that you're you're better than them or different than them in some way, or they want to elevate themselves because they have such low self esteem. If they can't improve their own self esteem through self improvement, what they do is they drag other people down to their level so that then they can shine. And I think some of the toxic relationship symptoms that we have here speak to that. Yes. So next up, I want to talk about the different types of toxic people. Now, the first one we have is the depreciator or the belittler. Deprecator. Deprecator. Belittler. Or the belittler. Eh, sorry, can't speak with that. So, this type of toxic individual will constantly belittle you. They will make fun of you, implying that, that anything you say or that expresses your ideas, beliefs, or want is silly or stupid. So, they basically want to put you down saying that you're not going to be smart, you're just being crazy, stuff like that. Right. And this is classic of someone who is with someone that they don't feel that they deserve because they may be smarter or prettier or uh, more athletic. So they drag down those attributes of that person, those high attributes to their own level. So that, okay, now we're on a playing field. Okay, you're dumb. So I'm dumb, you're dumb, we're on the same level here. So now I don't need to be jealous of you. So that's where a lot of that belittling comes from. It's to bring you down to their level. I mean, yeah, that's sort of a classic technique for bullies. Just like you mentioned before, they would constantly bring other people down to their level so that they don't feel jealous of them or they don't need to feel as though they need to do better. Exactly. Um, so this toxic partner wants all the decision-making power. They will often tell you that you are lucky to have them as a partner and that no one else would want you, which is definitely a bad mindset for anyone because it would make them feel unwanted, that honestly, and it would make them stay closer, which is really bad because this kind of toxic belittling is not something that they want to deal with on a regular basis but sadly if they stay in the relationship or if the, they don't make any changes they'll it'll happen and and that situation you get to that situation when you start to believe what this other partner is doing to you and you believe that their idea of your self-worth is what's accurate so when you bring your own self down to that level you're far less likely to be motivated to try and get out of that relationship because you start to believe that nobody else will want you and that you don't, you get to the point you just, you don't want to be alone. Yeah. So you're, 
you decided, okay, well, I'm going to put up with this because it's better than being alone. And oftentimes that's not really the case. Yes. The goal is to keep your self-esteem as low as possible so you don't challenge their absolute control of the relationship. And like I said before, most of these relationships revolved around the control of the other partner. So that was it for the belittler. Now is the bad-tempered partner. People might say that they have tried they have they have given up trying to argue with their partner because their partner gets so angry or loses his or her temper and then often don't interact with them in any meaningful ways for days. This behavior is often considered as controlling by intimidation. Now, this is the kind of person that will verbally scream at their partner. They don't they will constantly want to argue. They're they like it's very hard to change their perspective. Like if they think one way and you think another way, they're not going to change their perspective. They will hang on to it for dear life. And this was the definition of what my father was. My father was stubborn. He was pig-headed. Uh, he would argue no matter how much you proved that his point of view was wrong, he would continue to argue his point of view. And he would argue it because he enjoyed arguing and he never really understood the, the emotional drain that it had on the people around him. Mm-hmm. So, Often, these individuals have unpredictable and hair-trigger temper. The constant need for vigilance and inability to know what will trigger an angry outburst wears on both the victim's, emo- the victim's emotional and physical health. Have you ever heard of the idea of walking on eggshells around people? Yeah. That's what they're describing here. The fact that you never know what you're going to say to set that person off. It could be the most mundane, innocent thing. And you make a comment like, oh, how's the weather? And then all of a sudden they fly off the handle for no reason. Yeah, this makes them afraid to interact with them and just afraid to be around their presence. Absolutely, yeah. Which in any relationship is not what you want to have. Absolutely. This type of emotional abuser rarely shows their toxic side to the outside world. They are seen as a pleasant and easygoing person who everyone likes. Uh, yeah, I don't like those people who just fake it. Yeah. Like, then it'll make, th- um, it'll make the other person seem as though they're overreacting, and anyone who really isn't entirely close with them might take the other person's side. Absolutely. And it just makes me feel bad. The next type of toxic person we have is the guilt inducer. The the guilt inducer controls by encouraging you to feel guilty anytime you do something that they don't like. They will sometimes get someone else to convey their sense of disappointment or hurt to you. Now, this kind of person would probably be more of, like... Sort of that crying, begging kind of person. Like, they'd constantly want to guilt trip you, saying that whatever you did was wrong and you should feel bad about it, even if it's the littlest thing. And it's not going to be that bad. Absolutely. The guilt inducer not only controls by including guilt, but also by temporarily moving, removing guilt if you end up doing what they want you to do. For guilt-prone individuals, anything or anyone that removes guilt is very desirable, so the guilt inducer is extremely powerful in the means that control of your of their disposal. This, uh, ironically enough, it, the parallel here is, is kind of along the lines of organized religion. Um, the Catholic Church induces obedience through guilt. You know, you're a sinner. You did bad. So you need the Catholic Church in order to cleanse your soul so that you can go to heaven. Um, But from a relationship standpoint, a one on one relationship, you get a lot of, well, if you love me, you do this. And, oh, well, you didn't do that. So that means you don't love me. And they hold that that emotional ransom over people of. Of love. You know, you'll demonstrate you love me by doing a certain thing that I want you to do. And if they don't, well, then there's a consequence that I'm not going to love you and you'll feel guilty about it. 
So it's a very complex type of extortion that people have over people emotionally. Yeah, some people might not think that guilt is all that um, dangerous, but used in the guilt tripper, like, this is very dangerous. Like, say you accidentally broke a vase, and you were afraid to tell your parents, and you decide to lie. And that guilt builds up over time, getting you so emotionally that you end up telling your parents anyway, out of just sheer reason, just sheer guilt. And using that guilt as a toxic partner can be very dangerous. Right. Now, the example you just gave, that's legitimate guilt, where you did something and then tried to hide it, so you're inducing that guilt on yourself. <clears throat> and that's very powerful on your soul. Whereas when someone who is the guilt inducer, they artificially impose that on you. So they're manipulating you emotionally through guilt. And that guilt isn't even real. They made it up, basically. Yeah. And that's what's the most toxic part about it. Mm -hmm. Because if they really loved you, they wouldn't make you feel that bad. Yeah. So... And sometimes it's hard to see like that. Exactly. So the next one we have is the overreactor or the deflector. People who have an overreactor as a partner, you'll find yourself comforting them instead of getting comforted yourself if you're not feeling well. They will make you feel bad about yourself for being so selfish that you brought up something that upset your partner so much. This causes you initial concern, hurt, or irritation, to get lost so you can take care of your partner's feelings. Now, I definitely think this is a very dangerous partner because your mental health should come first from any relationship and anyone that can't take over your mental health shouldn't really be with you. This kind of toxic person will say that, oh, well, you don't know that this happened or, and then they'll like start crying and then you'll have to comfort them instead of them comforting you. Now, it is a two-way streak. You need to, you need to one, have a partner that you can comfort, and two, have a partner that can comfort you. But this is a one-way, but this is just a one-sided relationship. It's just you helping your partner's mental health while your mental health is starting to deteriorate. And, and the one thing to note about this is sometimes people act like this as a cry for help, where, they may not feel like they're getting the attention that they need or support that they need from their, their partner. Um, and as a result of that, they'll overreact if they feel that they're not getting it. So when you see something like this happen, it's not necessarily, necessarily that they're a toxic partner that are out for their own interest and they don't care about you. It's possible they might feel that they're not getting the attention that they need from the relationship. So when this happens, it could very well be sort of a warning sign of you're not doing your part as a partner. If it happens over and over again, then it's a different story when it happens to excess. Yes. On the other side, they could completely ignore when you try to talk through your problems with them, which is definitely not... which kind of coincides with what you were thinking. If they don't do this, then they probably then you probably just need to help them. But if they if they don't listen to when you do try to talk to your pro through your problems, then you m then they might have the to then they might be this toxic kind of partner. They would come back to you a few hour they would let's see. Uh they would come back to they would come back for a few hour or for they will. Uh, <laughs> They'd come back for no. a few more hours. Actually, I don't think so. No. They wouldn't come back for a few more hours and would somehow find a way to blame everything on you. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's definitely not good. No. So the next one we have is the overdependent partner. These toxic controllers want to make. Um, virtually every wants you to make every virtually every decision for them. You'll know that you made the wrong decision by your partner's passive aggressive behavior, such as pouting or not talking to you because you chose a, a movie or restaurant that they didn't enjoy. Now, these kinds of people 
um, want you to make their decision making. And whenever you don't make the wrong decision, it has a negative effect on both of them. And it may- what do you say about that kind of behavior? Sounds an awful lot like dinner time on the weekends around here. What do you want to do for dinner? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Somebody make a decision. Um, yes, it can be a real dream when you're the person who's making decisions all the time for everything. Um, and, and what compounds the difficulty of that is when you are forced to make the decisions and then the other person's not happy with those decisions, then not only is all the responsibility of decision making on you, all the um, risk of failure on making the wrong decisions is on you as well. So it can be overly burdensome for the, the target of this type of behavior. Yeah. Passivity can be an extremely powerful means of control. If you are influenced in a relationship with a passive controller, you are likely to experience constant anxiety and or fatigue as you worry about the effect of your decision on your partner, like you said. Right. And and that's the funny thing about this type of relationship is they may not come across as controlling because they're ceding all control to you. But by ceding all control to you, they're controlling you. Yeah. So it's kind of counterintuitive. And most people don't realize that they're being manipulated and controlled under those circumstances. Yeah. They basically use the opposite effect to have the exact same um, outcome. Yep. So the next one we have is the non-dependent toxic controller. This individual frequently disguises their toxic controlling behavior as simply asserting their independence. They control you by keeping you uncertain about what they are going to do. They'll tell you that they'll call you or something else, but then they won't. These types of people don't make you feel safe and secure in your relationship with them. It's just not their behavior, but their emotions that seem to be unpredictable as well. You will begin to feel like they don't like you anymore or don't want anything to do with you. If you ask them, their answer is just simply vague enough to keep you guessing. And these are warning signs like like we've talked about previously is, is when you're, you know, partnering with someone. And one day they show a tremendous amount of interest in you and the next day they can't even return your phone calls. That's usually a warning sign that either a, they're not really that interested in you or that they're using you for whatever, or B, you're not the only person that they happen to be dating at that point in time. And they're dividing their attention among various people. So if that's not something that you're interested in, in a relationship and you prefer to have, something that's a monogamous relationship where it's just you and one other person, then these are warning signs for you to start asking certain questions and maybe altering your behavior as well to let the other person know what type of relationship that you're looking for. Um, there people go into relationships with different intents all the time. And it's important that they know what you're looking for if you haven't expressed it to them. So this is, Sometimes a warning sign that you need to express those interests. Now, this might be one of the more commonly known toxic people, which is the user that some of these categories might also fall on. So users at the beginning of the rela- relationship often seem very nice and pleasant individuals. What makes a relationship with a user toxic is its one way nature and the fact that you'll never that you'll end up never having done enough for them. Users are big-time energy drainers who will, in fact, leave you if they find someone else who will do more for them. So, this kind of person is kind of just using you for their own benefit. That They don't normally do anything for you, and you do everything for them. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people out there like that. And there are providers that that are complementary to users. So the people, my mother was, was a provider. She always felt happiest when she had someone to take care of, to cook for, to do laundry for, um, to, you know, basically take care of them. And when 
you don't when the provider type of personality doesn't have that they don't they they feel as though they've lost a sense of purpose in life so users tend to prey on these types of people until to the point that they've leached everything out of them they've they've sucked them dry emotionally they've taken away monetarily from them and you reach a point where the user can't get any more out of you and then they leave you and they move on to their next victim. Yeah. They're almost like parasites in, in that respect. Basically. So a really adept user will occasionally do some small thing for you so that it does that that doesn't inconvenience them. Know that they will use this to induce guilt into you if you ever t- if you ever balk at doing something for them. Right. So they give a little bit back. To make it look as though they're a contributing member of the relationship. But should you not appreciate that, then they throw it in your face. Yeah. And that's kind of the same thing with the guilt inducer, although they don't have to use it often. Right. So the next, so the final one we have here is the possessive toxic controller. Early in your relationship with this toxic individual, you may have appreciated their jealousy, particularly if it isn't too controlling. At most, but not all, possessive... Possessive is... What? Possessives. Possessives will imply that once you two are married or in a committed relationship, they'll be just fine. Don't believe them. That Like, this kind of... Okay. So, they will become more and more suspicious and controlling as time goes on. They will, in short, make your life miserable. Over time, they will work hard to eliminate any meaningful relationships you have with friends and sometimes even with family. They only see you as a possession of them. Which is not good. Nope, not at all. So, basically, this kind of toxic person will start out being really open to all your friends and then there's they have different ways on how they all get get you to stop hanging out with them. They'll nitpick things that they don't like about your friends, um, and soon you'll stop wanting to talk to them. And at some point, it might even get to the point where you won't even be able to see your own family. They'll, ba- they'll basically treat you as though they're your possession, and if they're the only relationship you have, they have much more control over everything you do. Yes, they treat you as though they own you, and they just want to take you, and they want to put you on a shelf like a trophy. Yes. And they don't want anyone else looking at you, or talking to you, or touching you, or anything, uh, because you're theirs. Yeah. Um, And, uh, you know, you hear that type of statement, and you wonder how, how people actually allow that to happen. And it doesn't start off quite like that. It starts off fairly innocent, little, you know... When you start dating someone in the beginning and they're jealous of your attention, it's almost flattering. Like, oh, they, you know, they want my time and they want to devote themselves to my time. And it it kind of lifts your spirits and it makes you feel good for, for the beginning. And then when it gets to the point where, oh, my God, they, they want to spend every minute with me. They don't want me out of their sight. It starts to get very smothering. Yes. And that's where you start to run into issues where, you know, not every couple can spend every waking minute together. And other people have other friends um, and they want to spend time with their friends. They have different interests, different activities and so forth. And the possessive partner feels as though you're being disloyal to them or that you don't love them or they, it feels like when you give your attention to someone else, it lessens them. So then they sort of lean on you and and they very quickly become a guilt inducer in the process. Yeah. Many of these can be combined into um, one person if the toxic person is powerful enough to use it. Absolutely. So we'll take a short break and we'll go to how to stop some of these toxic relationships. Okay. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture 
culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. So one thing you must understand if you're trying to get out of a toxic relationship is that you really can't change your toxic partner. You can't change someone's decisions or how they decide to behave. But you can change yourself. You can lead yourself to behave in different ways towards your partner, which could cause them to change their behavior um, if you do it right. So... One of the things, another thing you can do is calmly but firmly confront your partner's toxic behavior. You must also let them know that their behavior is no longer acceptable and suggest alternative behaviors for them. Okay. So. So. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I, I think. I, I think in order to come to that determination, you kind of need to look at the relationship itself, find out what value you're getting from the relationship, and find out how much you want to invest in the relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, it's possible, like in the case of my mom and dad, 30 years down the line when you've reached the point that you don't want to put up with my father's ridiculous rants and, and screaming – you might look at that and say, well, we've been married for 30 years. We've got four children. We've got a house. We've got this. We've got that. I could, I could, I've put up with it for 30 years. I can continue to put up with it because I don't want to start over 30 years later. Whereas if you're in a relationship in the early stages, you may decide, well, I don't really want to spend the rest of my life with someone who's going to make me feel miserable. And based on that, you determine whether or not you want to try and change the relationship. So you kind of have to <clears throat> evaluate the value you place on your partner and the value that you place on the relationship and what you've invested in it and determine, is it worth saving? If it is, what kind of effort do I have to put into saving it? What do I have to put up with? What have I put up with? And what do I need to do in order to correct things? Because you have to remember, just because your partner may fall into one of these toxic categories, you might as well. Because everyone has flaws. So if you're toxic in your own way, you may be contributing to their own toxicity of your partner. So if you find yourself in a toxic relationship, find out if you feel like, you know, you can validate whether or not you fall into any of these categories and then try to improve yourself. Um, you make a very valid point that you're not going to change your partner. Um, people do change and they have to have a good reason for changing. Yeah. And if they feel that the relationship itself is in jeopardy, they may decide that the relationship and the partner is worth changing for and making that effort and taking those extra steps. Um, people are um, habitual by nature. You know, people fall into these habits and they, they always seem to fall back into these ruts where they're comfortable. And sometimes a relationship is about shaking things up and taking people out of that comfort zone and letting them know that the effect that, their level of comfort has on other people is detrimental. And sometimes illustrating to that, that to people is enough to make them change or at least be more cognizant. Uh, you can't expect to just completely change people overnight, but you know, people, people can learn. Mm -hmm. So you really have to determine if it's worth 
throwing the relationship out. Now, if the relationship is very detrimental to you, if it's physically abusive, if it's mentally abusive, you're probably better off getting out of there and getting some distance so that you can ground yourself. Even if you do decide you want to continue a relationship, you need some distance there to heal before you can summon the strength to combat that situation. Yeah. Another thing you need to keep in mind when you're trying to help out a toxic relationship, you need to believe that you need that you deserve to be treated with compassion, courtesy, and respect. If you can't have your partner treat you like that, then you might need to end the relationship. Your mental health comes first. That's all I really need to say about this. That's basically what this means. You need to deserve you need to believe that you deserve to be treated kindly with love and compassion and if your partner can't do that i'd recommend it should you should leave absolutely you you know how you want to be treated you know what makes you happy and and you know what you can provide to someone else in a relationship to try and offer that same thing in return and if the person that you're in a relationship with is not interested in your well-being and your happiness then it's not a relationship worth being in. Like, I know, you know, I trust mommy implicitly. I know she's not going to do anything that will outwardly harm me or bring me harm or cause me any duress. I know that she would do anything she could to stop that sort of thing from happening. And I'm the same way with her. You know, yes, there are times because of the way that I joke around and, and try to always make light of things that I say stupid things. And when I say stupid things and I say things that, that might be hurtful and come to the realization afterwards, I do apologize for it, mm -hmm. but it's never done with the intent to hurt. And any one of these toxic personalities, they do things with the intent to induce harm on you in order to get a positive result for them. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's willing to do that is generally not worth being with because they're not looking out for your best interests. Yes. So when you first try to confront your partner, understand that they will probably accelerate their controlling behavior. You must be able to handle whatever they do. If you need to repeat your request, then do so. If they refuse again, think about stepping away for them for 30 days, like you said, taking a break. If after you repeat your request and they still refuse, then it's time to end the relationship. They just didn't change. But like you said, people can change. If you keep, if you, you just didn't need to set boundaries. Like, like, if they still refuse, then just take 30 days away and maybe they'll decide to change. But if they... So, something important to note. You can't attempt to fix a toxic relationship if you're prepared to leave it. That's the main thing. You need to be prepared to leave it. Like, you need to be mentally and physically prepared. Right. Like, if you're not prepared, then they could... Like, the guilt inducers can probably just... Well, any of the toxic users can guilt-induce you into staying, and you need to be prepared for that. You right, and the problem is is that they've probably spent months or years working on you to bring your self-confidence down to make you think that staying is the better alternative, where if you leave, you're not going to find someone that's going to treat you as good as I am or, or something like that. Or if you leave, you're going to be alone. It's that fear that these toxic personalities play on. Uh, so you're right. If, you're, if you want to invest the time and the effort and the emotional energy to, to solve the problem, ultimately you have to understand and come to terms with the fact that that resolution may require you to walk away from the relationship. And once you've come to that realization – then you can go about solving the problem because that's one of the solutions. Yeah. So there is one exception that I definitely want to mention. If your partner physically abuses you in any way, I wouldn't try to fix it. They might not change from that. Like, mentally abusive can be fixed. But physically, like, some scars may heal, 
others don't. That's basically what this is sort of saying. Like, men- like you can easily fix your mental health. But if the person is physically abusive to you and you've gotten many bruises from them, I wouldn't recommend trying to fix it. At least step away for a few months. Just just to get away from that. And if they do come and change, well, actually, um, the person who made this article definitely said that no matter how sorry they are, just don't stay in the relationship. Your safety comes first. And they're right. Like, I wouldn't say in any type of abusive relationship that's just physically abusive that could cause physical harm to anyone. I wouldn't recommend staying in that relationship no matter how sorry the person is. Like, I, like I get, again, guilt. They can use it. They can. And I, I agree with you 100% there. And the one thing that you have to keep in mind in a physically abusive relationship is they're not going to make you feel bad emotionally. They're going to hurt you physically. And and physical violence in a romantic relationship can quickly escalate to dangerous levels. And especially when there's a threat of you ending that relationship, that could very easily send someone who's already demonstrated their willingness to use physical violence on you, it could move them to escalate that physical violence to something even worse. So in the event of physical abuse, you need to get out of that relationship immediately. Yes. I would even venture to say that you need legal protection at that point as well. Because just walking away from that relationship, depending on how aggressive they are physically, walking away from that relationship could put you in more danger if you don't take the necessary precautions, restraining orders, court orders, you know, having the police involved. You never want to see a relationship get to that point. Unfortunately, it happens quite frequently. So understand that before you do walk away, make sure you have those protections in place so that they can't escalate. Your your partner cannot escalate that violent part of the relationship. Yes, I definitely agree. So, if you are in any kind of toxic relationship, whether it be family, friends, or your significant other, it's important to do something about it. You shouldn't stay in that toxic relationship. It can be talking to the toxic person or seeking outside help from others, like any of your healthy relationships, or maybe even going to see a therapist or, um, counseling. Just know that you don't have to be stuck in that relationship forever. There is always some way out of it. You should take control of the toxic relationship if it's hurting you in any way. It might not be easy, but it's possible. Very well said. Yep. So, that is all we have for today. Um, we'll take a small... We'll come back with my closing remarks and shoutouts. Sounds good. Go for your closing remarks. So, I kind of already said this before. Ah, Thanks. I kind of already said this before, but if you are in any toxic relationship, just know there'll be a way out of it. You can, you can, but you have to be prepared mentally to leave the relationship if necessary. Having a toxic partner being super controlling um, is kind of hard to leave because... Guilt is a very powerful thing. Many peop- many mental, m- emotional and mental manipulators use guilt in order to stay in that relationship so that you stay under control. Just please, if you're in any toxic relationship, do seek some help and get out of that relationship if you need to. Or if you can fix it, please fix it. Okay, very good. I think that was all we had today. Uh, Before we go, I would invite people to check out our long-form articles on Medium at medium.com slash insights into things. I would also encourage you to subscribe to our podcast. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. We're now on Amazon's podcast as well. We recently listed on there. Um... 
I would also uh, ask that you give us some of your feedback. We'd love to hear from you uh, on topics that we're discussing. Did you have any thoughts? Did you have any topics you'd like to hear us talk about? You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get all of our videos, high-res videos, on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. Our audio podcasts are available at podcast.insightsintoentertainment. I'm sorry, insightsintoteens.com. Entertainment's our other show. Yep. Uh, you can also get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Uh, when you are looking to subscribe, uh, our audio podcast can be found under insights into teens, and our video podcast can all be found under insights into things and you can get us six days a week streaming on twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things or conveniently enough you can get links to all those things on our website at www.insightsintothings.com and you and don't forget get uh, and don't forget to check out our other two podcasts insights into entertainment hosted by you and mommy and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast hosted by you and my brother, Sam. Very good. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.